This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. See, I guess well, this is the last lecture. Oh, you can turn off all amplification in here. So I don't, I don't need any um, amplification here. Thanks. Um, we'll finish up a couple of topics in, in reachability, and I'll just do a couple of topics in uh, observability. It's not a hugely important topic. And then I want to reserve some time at the end of, the, en end of uh, this class uh, to just say a few things uh, about at the very highest levels about what the class is, how all the stuff fits together, and, and this sort of stuff. So that's, uh, that, that's what we'll do. So continuous time reachability we looked at last time, which in fact was, uh, I guess for the people here in real time, was this morning. And we looked at uh, what's the reachability uh, subspace for a continuous time system. So that's the set of all points you can hit uh, in t seconds starting from zero in a continuous time system. And the answer turned out to be really simple in this case. It's not interesting or subtle like in a continuous time system where you know at, at each step for a while anyway interesting things can happen. You can sort of hit a few points and some more and all this kind of stuff. It, it just all happens at once. What happens is if t is positive, then the set of points you can hit is the range of the controllability matrix period. It doesn't change with t. t is positive. What will change, of course, is the size of the input required to hit a target state if you do this real quickly as opposed to if you do it on a real, on, on a long, leisurely uh, time frame. So we also looked at this last time. Uh, if you want to look at the least norm input for reachability, you're looking for the input that minimizes this integral of the square of the norm of, of u. And we work through that by discretizing it. And the, and the formula that came out was, was this. Quite straightforward. It was this, this integral of a positive definite, uh, positive semi-definite matrix. The, the integral itself is positive definite. There's this inverse. And then that's multiplied by this thing over here, which is b transpose times e to the t minus tau. Now this is actually, basic, that's the system running backwards in time. I think I commented on it this morning. And all the parts of this correspond perfectly to the discrete time case. They're just, they're d the, instead of having an exponential, you have a power. These are just time propagators, for example. Um, the other thing I should mention is that this whole thing is really something just like c transpose c, c transpose inverse. The difference is C is now like this kind of big complicated operator. It's not a matrix as it was in the discrete time case. So, but this is the analog of CC transpose here, or sorry, sorry C transpose, sorry, CC transpose, um, and, and that's, uh, that's, that's C transpose here is what this is supposed to, that, that's what the analog, this is the analog of. Okay, now what happens then is that you can work out a formula for the minimum energy to hit a state in an amount of time t. And it's a quadratic form, and it's a quadratic form that depends on q of t inverse, where q is this integral. So it's an integral of e to the tau a, bb transpose, e to the tau a transpose. Very familiar here, because this is nothing more. It's, this is sort of a, that's the time propagator for what an, what an action at now, what effect it has on the state tau seconds in the future. You integrate this action. That's sort of like the same as summing in the discrete time case. And you invert. And this is, in fact, I guess you have a, at least we had one homework problem on this. This is a Gram matrix, in fact. So this is an integral of, I mean, that's a, that's a Gram matrix. And it's an integral, uh, it's an integral of something times something transpose. That's a Gram matrix. Okay, now we can conclude all sorts of interesting things here. For example, if T is bigger, you integrate you add more positive semi-definite terms, or uh, a, whatever you want to call it, an integrand, uh, to this thing, and Q gets bigger, and that means Q inverse gets smaller. So here again, you have the, the idea that as the time horizon gets longer, the minimum energy required to hit a target in longer time goes down. Okay? The difference now is that T can be arbitrarily short. 
and you may need a very large input. By the way, as T gets shorter and shorter and shorter, you start ge this generates inputs which in fact converge to something like the impulsive inputs that we looked at earlier. So there are impulsive inputs that get you the transfer you to a state immediately. Of course, an impulsive input is arbitrary is extremely large. Here, uh, this, this will actually construct the impulsive, uh, the impulsive inputs. Now we can also look at what happens when t goes to infinity. Now, this matrix always exists because this thing is monotone increasing in the matrix sense. That's, that's, mono, that's non decreasing, and therefore the inverse. That's, this is a positive semi-definite matrix, uh, sorry, positive definite matrix, and it's decreasing as a, as a function of, cap, of t. So this goes down. It's the quadratic form that tells you how much energy it requires to hit a point, any point in state space. This goes down. It has a limit, therefore. And we'll call that limit p. It's the same as before. And that gives you the minimum energy to reach a point with arbit arbitrarily leisurely. So that's, that's, what that, uh, that's what that means. OK. Now. It's the same story. If, if, if the matrix A is stable, then this integral uh, converges here. Doesn't go to, doesn't, nothing goes to infinity here if A is stable. Why? Well, because if A is stable, e to the tau A, all the terms in it look like polynomials times decaying exponentials. So this, this term simply converges. And therefore, P converges to the inverse of that and is therefore positive definite. And that says, basically, if a system is stable, then the amount of energy required to hit a point arbitrarily leisurely is going to always cost energy. So there's, there's no point you can get to for free, for example. Or there's no point you can get to with arbitrary low energy. I mean, it makes sense. If it's stable, it sort of means that left to its own dynamics, the system state will go back to zero. So it means that if you want to get to some state, you have to fight against that. And that, that's what tells you that P is going to be positive definite. So that's, that's basically the, uh, the idea here. We can look at the idea of general state transfer. That's transferring a state from an initial condition, ti, uh, to some final state, t desired. And it's, it's all very similar. It's the same as the discrete time case. What you do is you say this. You say that the final state is equal to this. It's the initial state. Then propag that's the time propagator. That propagates you forward in time, tf minus ti seconds here. That's this part. And so this is exact, this is where you would land if, if you were 0. If you did nothing, this is where you'd land. This is the effect of the input over that interval, like this. And so the whole thing, you realize the following. You, this is equal to that. This is equal to x desired, if and only if, if you put this on the other side, if u steers x of 0 to x of ti minus tf to this thing here, which is x desired minus this term, which is sort of compensates for the drift term. Right? And in fact, all of this kind of makes sense. This says that if you wanted to steer something to a certain place, you, what you do is this, is you, you first find out what would happen if you did nothing, and that would be over here. I subtract that from this, and then I, I act as if I'm going from 0 to hit that point, and everything will work out. That's by linearity. So, so this all works out. OK. Um, now, for continuous time, it's a lot easier, because basically the system is either controllable or it's uncontrollable, and that means, that means you don't get any of the subtleties. It means Basically, if it's controllable, you can get from anywhere, anywhere else, in arbitrarily small time. Possibly with a very large input. But nevertheless, you can go from anywhere, anywhere else, in any amount of time, as long as it's positive. You can do it in zero time if, you're, if you allow yourself to use impulsive inputs. So that's how that works. OK, so let's just look at an example to see how this, um, this works. Here's a Three masses stuck between two walls, and some, uh, we have some springs and we have some dampers, and we can apply two tensions uh, here. I think we've seen this example before. So, okay, and your, your state is uh, six dimensional. It's the positions and the displacements of all, it's, sorry, it's the displacements and the velocities of the three masses. And the system looks like this. So it's, um, and th the blocks here make sense. This basically says, that this, is, this top three are the positions, and it says the position dot is equal to, you read this as 0i. So it says that the top three, d, d, t, are equal to the bottom three, 
That's by definition, because the bottom three states are the derivatives. And then these two come from the uh, stiffness and from the damping. And then these two tell you how the two tensions apply forces to the different masses here. That, that's what this is. Okay, so we want to steer the state, let's say, from E1. So E1 means the following. E1 means that this mass is displaced one unit to the right, and the other two are, dis are at zero, and every one is at rest. So that's what E1 is. And we want to take that to the zero state. Okay? Now, by the way, if we do nothing, it's going to go to the zero state asymptotically anyway. And I, I can't remember what the eigenvalues are, but uh, I think we, we looked at this example before, and the eigen, I think the eigenvalues are on the order of 1, maybe, maybe there's a slow one on the order of 0.2, or something like that. It doesn't matter. The point is that the thing, whole thing will decay to 0 at, at some rate. By the way, that, that, bring, that builds the intuition here easily. It says that left to its own devices, this is stable. The, the state is going to go to 0 anyway. So therefore, if I give you a, a long enough time period, long enough that just by through natural dynamics the state has decayed, it's going to cost very little to drive it exactly to zero. By the way, by its own natural, with its own natural dynamics, the state is not going to go to zero exactly. It will just get small. It may get very small. But the point is, once it's small, it takes a very little kick to actually move it directly to zero. And therefore, it take, we expect it to take very little energy. Okay? So, what happens is the following. Here's a, a plot of the energy required to steer it from one displacement one, then zero, zero, and zero initial velocity to zero in t seconds. Very interesting plot. It says basically for six seconds and more, the amount of energy required is extremely small. By the way, is it zero? Can't possibly be. If it were zero, it would mean you'd apply no input. If you apply no input, it never gets exactly to zero. But the point is, it's extremely small. So this, this is explained by the fact that the natural dynamics has made it small anyway. What's interesting here is that this thing now ramps up uh, very aggressively. Um, by the way, does this thing go to infinity or stop, like in the discrete time case? No, this keeps going. So you could do this in 0 0.01 seconds. There's, ab there's an input. The energy required is absolutely enormous. You can work out what it is, but you can do it so you can do it arbitrarily fast. But you can see exactly what's happening here, is that you can, you can move the whole thing to zero very quick, as quickly as you like. It just takes more and more energy. And this is quite kind of obvious here. By the way, the practical use would be you know, somewhere around here, uh, where you would be pulling this thing back to zero a lot faster than if you just waited for it to settle out. I, I should actually mention something about this. There are lots of applications of this. Um, I mean, tons. Um, a, a lot of them have to do with things where you, you, you have a mechanical system where you move something from one place to another. I, I, I just thought of another one that's not mechanical. You move it from one place to another. When it arrives there, it's sort of wiggling a little bit. But you can't use it until it stabilizes. I'll give you a, a first example is disk, uh, disk drive head positioner. So you say, please go please seek track 255 or something. So this thing zooms over here, lands close, but when it ends there, it's sort of shaking. It's got to track, it's got to track the track very carefully. You can't use it when it's shaking. So in fact, what you do when you land there is you do something like this. You actually actively apply an input that will basically do active damping, that will, that will remove all the wiggling in it and allow you to track faster. So things like this are, this is actually used now. Um, the other applications I know in XY stages, so for uh, in lithography, um, these are extremely expensive machines for printing uh, integrated circuits and things like that, and they move over a couple centimeters at a time, and they move, and then they they align themselves to accuracies that are just like un uh, just unbelievable. I mean, it's like at the nanometer level has to be, if if you're looking at current. Uh, technology. So, which is actually quite ridiculous to imagine something that moves two centimeters, then stable, not just, sta isn't even wiggling at the nanometer level and stabilizes itself absolutely to something at the nanometer level. So the way that's done, oh and by the way, the, the, the reason, it's of course stable, so you can move over there and just wait for the whole thing to stop wiggling and then expose, expose your wafer. Um, now the problem is this machine costs like some huge sum of money. So the it, you're going to have the cost divided by the throughput. So if 
89 percent, you know, 90 percent of the time, you're waiting for the thing to stop wiggling so that you can do your lithography. Um, that's not a good that's not a good investment. So in fact, they use active control to do this, where you move it over two centimeters, and you definitely apply inputs that will do active damping and and will and will will cause it to stop shaking early. So that's one. And I'll mention just one more, just for fun, from MRI. So in MRI. You do these things. I don't know. I don't, I don't know any of the details. I don't know the physics, but you line up all these. Uh, these, these oh, you, you line up. Uh, you line up all the magnetic axes, and then you let go, and they, and they, 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 they slowly drift down like this. And you don't do another uh, scan slice uh, until they've totally relaxed again, or something like this. That's method. But you can actually use a method where you act instead of waiting. I guess they have times like T1 and. T Does anyone here do MRI? Too bad, someone could have got me out. They could have told me what T1 and T2. There's like T1 and T2 or the two relaxation times or something like this. You wait one of these amounts of times or something like that to do it again. If you want to do fast throughput MRI, you don't wait. You actively force the spins down to zero. How? Using um, like these formulas here, like this one. Okay? And you improve the throughput. And again, you have a big expensive machine whose throughput is now better because you're actually not waiting for something to stabilize out. You're forcing it to stabilize it out fast, and therefore it's ready for reuse again. So, okay, sorry, that was just a weird aside. Um, okay, um, if you want to look at what some of these inputs look like, we can do that. Um, uh, pretty much almost for the dot that I drew, which was in, in three seconds, this is the input that you would apply. Uh, these are the two two forces. It's symmetric, but then you know the whole problem is symmetric. So anyway, um, so these are the these are the two for, these are the two uh, tensions you you would apply. They're, I I don't think they're obvious. Um, so this is what it looks like for for uh, for this is the least norm input for for bringing the system to zero in three seconds. Um, if you go, if you relax that just to four seconds, it gets a lot smaller. Why? Because now the natural dynamics itself. Is um, is helping you, so so that's four. Um, and if you look at the the um, if you if you look at the the output for u equals zero, this is the, oh I guess now we have our answer. Um, this says if you just kind of let the thing go with no input, you'd see that it's it's pretty small in eight seconds. Of course, it's not zero, um, but it's pretty you know it's already kind of so when you're taking it to zero in three seconds, you can see you're actually doing something. I mean, depending on the accuracy with which this thing has to be zero before it can be reused, yeah, you can see that you're actually, I mean, you're actually doing something. And you're doing something that it is, is substantially better than just letting this thing settle out by itself. So, okay. So I think these are all kind of, um, uh, kind of, uh, th these are all kind of obvious here. Um, let's see if I can, uh, yeah, these, these just show things like the, the output for, for three and four and things like that. It, it, but they're, they're kind of obvious. So I think that finishes up this topic of controllability. Um, I want to emphasize that, except for the fact that some of it was continuous time, there's absolutely nothing new in controllability. It's just applied linear algebra. If you know what range is, if you know how to solve linear equations, if you know how to find the least norm solution, if you know the least norm solution of a set of linear equations, then all of this is just an application of that. So, okay. Now we'll look at the Last topic in the class, it's, um, it's also, it, like controllability, it just fall, it's, it's, it's not important. I think you've even done, or maybe controllability stuff, I think you were doing well before it had a name, I think. Um, I think we already had, didn't we have a problem on the midterm? Where you had to find an input that took you somewhere and, there was one, yeah, okay. So, so I mean, that's my point, is you don't, it, all we did now is just give a name to it, that's all, so. Okay, the same is true of the observability and state estimation. These are just exercises. So, what we'll do is we'll look at this idea of state estimation and discrete time observability and stuff like that. But let's let's get a let's get the setup here. Um, so we consider a discrete time system. This is in the general case. The setup would be something like this. You'd have x of t is a x of t plus b u of t plus w of t, and w of t is is called a state disturbance. Uh, or noise. Uh, another name for this is a process noise. That's another one you hear. Oh, and you have all of this in economics too, and it's got a different name there, and I forget what it's called. But it's got in 
in things like chemical process control, this would be called the process noise. Um, it's got all sorts, I'm trying to remember what it is in uh, economics, in econometrics. I can't remember, but maybe I'll remember during the lecture. It doesn't matter. It's got some other name, but it's identical to this. So, um, and here also you have a V of T, which is a noise on your measurement here. So that's called sensor noise or error. It's also called measurement noise. It's got all sorts of, uh, all sorts of names. Okay. And the assumption here is that A, B, C, and D are known. But what, what you want to do is you're, you're going to observe input and output over some time interval. And you want to estimate the state. And there are lots of problems about estimating the state that you You might want to estimate the current state, the initial state. You might want to estimate the next state. In finance, that would be of tremendous interest, right, to, to, uh, to, to estimate what the next uh, what the price uh, or what the returns for tomorrow would be. That would be of great interest. Um, so there are lots of problems you want to do. And, and, and this is going to be based on U and Y. Um, and this is basically going to be a, a particular application of just this. And I'm going to do some horrible notation. What I'm writing down now is notation uh, from week five or something like that. It's going to be just a big problem of this form, which basically is you have some you have some parameters you want to estimate. You call it x. You have a linear mapping that maps x into some measurements plus a corrupting noise. And then you ask a question like, based on y, what can you say about x? Okay. And well, of course, there's there's the. We can do the platonic case. We'll we'll get that. That's that's easy. That's just. The answer is it depends on the null space of A or something like that. We'll get to that later. And then once you introduce a noise, it gets more interesting. And now you can say interesting things about how to do this. And for example, you might use least squares here. And we'll say that's the same, that what's going to be the same here. But it's going to be more complicated. But you could map all of this big complicated thing into something that looks like that. Um, it's bad notation because Y we're already using here. X is here and A is different from what it is or something like that. But anyway, OK. So let's see how that, that works. So the state estimation problem is this. You want to estimate um, the state at some time s from the inputs up to time t minus 1 and the outputs from uh, up to time t minus 1. That's, and if, if, you're, if, you're, if s is 0, you're doing initial, uh, estimating the initial state. That's initial state estimation. Um, if you're doing uh, s equals t minus 1, that's, that's current state estimation. If you're doing s equals t, that's, call, that's called the one step ahead predictor is what you're doing, because you're trying to guess what it's going to be on the next step. Okay? Um, and there's all sorts of other variations on it. If s is something like t minus 5, some people call that a smoother or something like that, because you're sort of using future observations to go back and make your most intelligent guess about what the state was five, five samples ago. Um, if you're actually trying to, if s is t plus 5, you're doing a five state predictor, a five sample, a five epoch predictor. You're trying to predict what will the state be in five samples, five, uh, five epochs in the future. Okay? So, by the way, in a lot of these problems, uh, despite using all sorts of fancy methods, needless to say, your answer could be useless. Right? I mean, that kind of goes without saying. If I ask you, I mean, if you, can, if you can't predict tomorrow's returns, you certainly can't predict next summer's returns or something like that. That's, that's silly. Um, and that's fine. Of course, that comes up here. We don't dwell on it, really, um, uh, there. But it, it's a fact, of course. So, you know, if I, if I don't, if I give you, if I, if I don't give you anywhere, if I don't give you good enough measurements with which to estimate a parameter, then, of course, you can be as sophisticated as you like. And you'll, you won't predict anything that's worthwhile at all. So, and the same is true here. Maybe here it's, it's kind of more dramatic. OK. So if you have something that estimates, the, um, that, that estimates uh, the, a state, it's sometimes called an observer or a state estimator. And it's got other names in other fields. And it's, it's used in lots of other fields. Now, a generic notation that is pretty widely used is something like this. Um, you would have, you call x hat of s uh, given t minus 1 is an estimate 
it's supposed to denote, it denotes an estimate of x of s given input and output information all the way up to t minus 1. Now, the notation, of course, is meant to, it's, well, it's meant to suggest something like a conditional expectation. This is, again, if you have that background. And there are, in fact, cases where x hat of s given t minus 1 is nothing more than the conditional expectation of x of s given input and output information up to t minus 1. Um, but in general, but here I'm just using it to say it is an estimate of x of s based on that information. It doesn't have to be a statistical method you use, anything. Least, we'll see. We can, we'll show how to use least squares or something. That's the idea. Um, now, by the way, I claim that you, could just, you can just do this right now because all you would do is put it in this form. I mean, you'd have to stuff the right matrix A and it would be a pain, and it'd be some debugging you'd have to get right. But I promise you, all of those state estimation problems, they look, not, they look just like this. You have to figure out what x is. You'd have to stuff a in the right way and all that kind of stuff. And then you'd use least squares, and that would be that. So and actually, that wouldn't be a bad. You'd, be, you'd actually make estimators that would be pretty good. So let's, um, we'll go through the, the, the this, the more standard discussion of, of, of all this. It says, let's start with a noiseless case. Actually, that's probably a good idea to start for anything, because if you can't do it in a noiseless case, then you shouldn't be trying to do it when there's noise. So we'll start with this. Um, let's just find the initial state with no state or measurement noise. Then you have xt plus 1 is ax of t plus b u of t. y of t is cx of t plus d u of t. And what you can do is I can write down the output as, first of all, I can write it down as a, a function of the initial state. That's what we want. This is what we want. That's what we want to estimate. That's a matrix OT. OT is this matrix here. Because the output y of 0 is cx of 0. y of 1 is cx of 1. And the portion of that due to x of 0 is c a x of 0. That's this, and so on. Notice this thing is o t. o is for observer as opposed to c, the script c, which is for controller. And it looks very similar to your friend b, a, b, a squared b, and so on. Except this one is stacked vertically. The c is on the other side, and it's c. And in fact, the components should be totally obvious here. Like, for example, you know, c a to the sixth is a block row in this. And it basically says, the, it's it, easy to describe exactly what CA to the sixth is. It's this. It takes the initial state, it propagates it forward six samples, and then it takes it at C, then operates to map a state to an output measurement. So CA to the sixth is the matrix which maps state now to what, this, to what the output will see in six samples. I think I got that right. So that's what, that's what CA to the 6. So that's what all these are. These are just, it's a time propagator followed by a measurement matrix. Nothing else. Now T, this I may have been like on your first homework or something stupid like that. T is basically, the, this describes the mapping of how the input maps to the output. I think it was, was that on the home, first homework or something? I think so. Something like this was anyway. Um, and that's easy to work out. Again, you just have to stuff the matrices in the right way. It's a, it's, T is for toplets, because that's a toplets matrix, and a block toplets, and it looks like this. This is, this is what tells you how y of 0 depends on u of 0. And, and the fact that this is lower block triangular tells you it means something. It means causality. Because this says that basically y of 0, so I put u of, u, u of 0 down to u of t minus 1. Oh, by the way, note that I've decided now to go back to writing the u's in order, uh, not in reverse time like we did before. But I can write them any way I like it. just have to be clear about it. So if I do this, then this first row says that y of 0 is du of 0 and has nothing whatsoever to do with u of 2, u of 1, up to u of 2 minus 1. That makes perfect sense because, well, the output at time 0 has nothing to do with what you put into the system at 1, 2, 3, and so on. It's causal. And that's what this is. And all of these things should make perfect sense. B, C, A to the T minus 2B 
That's B takes you from an input, has an immediate effect. A to the T minus 2 propagates you forward in time. And C maps the effect on the state to the effect on an output. So this makes perfect sense here. No, it's actually causal. Um, it is causal because we fix the initial state. So yeah. this matrix is only if we are looking at the initial state. That's right. No, uh, sorry, no, it's not. Um, it's as if the initial state, the initial state, the, the term for the initial state, sorry, is here. So I've separated out. Well, no, I guess, actually, I do accept what you said. It's because we're looking at the initial state. Therefore, the initial state appeared here. If we were looking at the final state, then it would be on to you got it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but in any case, what I can say is this. You, this is just an exercise in matrix stuffing. You just need to put it in a form that looks like this. A measurement that you know is equal to, in this case, it's something, it would go something like this. The output, which you know, is equal to a matrix times the state you're looking for. I wrote it down for x equals 0, for t equals 0, but it could have been t equals 5. doesn't matter. Could have been t, it could have been t plus 5, meaning look five states in the future. So that would be there. That matrix is known times the thing you want to get. And then plus another term, which is something you know. So this, has a, this thing here has, a, has a, a very strong meaning. This term here is very interesting. This is the effect on the output due to the input. Now, the, you know the input, and you know that. So in fact, you know this term. It's actually your predicted output is what it really is. It's, it's what you would predict the output was if the initial state were 0. So that's what, that's what this is. And actually, that'll just go away, in fact, uh, that, that term. So you can rewrite these equations this way. This way. You write OT times x of 0, that's what we want, is equal to something we know with the output. We measured it. Minus, and then this is a beautiful thing. That's, that's something we know times something we know. So this whole right-hand side is something we know. But the interpretation of the right-hand side is quite, quite nice. This is what we directly measured. We also know this. Possibly we measured it. When we measured this and propagate it through the matrix, presumably that that exists as some uh, as 15 lines of C somewhere. So this actually goes down. This goes down in a computer. And this basically is your estimate of what you would see if the state were zero. You subtract that from what you did see. And this is now it may exist only in some uh, processor. It may not have to exist in practice. I mean, as, a, as an analog signal. It may exist only in a processor. This signal over here on the right is beautiful. It's kind of, it's the, it's the, it's the output kind of cleaned up from what you, from, from the effects of the input or something like that. So let me try that again. It's the output, I got it. I'm going to try it again. It's the output with the effects of the input removed. But it was, it was removed synthetically. It wasn't done you know, an analog. It was done um, in a processor. That's what this is. Then this says, okay, what's left is only the effect of, is only the component of the output which is due to the initial state, although this would be x of s, it'd be some other state of it if you're estimating something else. And now, you, now you're back to week three, which is to say you have a, a skinny, uh, you have ax minus b with a skinny. Because presumably you have more measurements than you have uh, unknowns. And that's it. And you can do all sorts of things. If there's no noise at all, you can just solve the equation with your favorite left inverse. If there's noise, you might want to do least squares. Yeah, I mean, that might be the right thing to do in some cases. Uh, but you wouldn't do it always. Or you might not do it always. OK, so with no noise, we can answer everything. It goes like this. It says we can determine the initial state of the system only if the null space of this observability matrix is zero. That says the observability matrix, the columns are independent. That's what it says. By the way, note the nice kind of duality to what we looked at earlier with controllability. So in controllability, you have B, A, B, A squared, B, and so on. And, what, and everything came down, this idea of controllability came down to, in that one, 
it came down to something very simple. It was that this fat matrix should be full rank. It should be onto. In this case, it's a skinny matrix and it should be full rank. The meaning in the first case is you can, there's an input uh, which will take you from anywhere to anywhere else, at least in n steps. In this case, it says something like this. If I observe n or more samples of the input and output, I can predict the state exactly if there's no noise. That's what this says. Okay? So that, that's the analog of what it means to be full, full for O to be full rank. In, the, in this case, you call the thing uh, observable. Okay. Notice that the input here has no, no effect whatsoever on estimating the state. Now, there actually are cases when this is not quite right, but in, in, because basically it can just be subtracted off immediately. So this is very strict. People would say, no, that doesn't make any sense. Um, I would rather get it, you know, it's better if you're not doing anything. Someone else might say, no, 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 you, get, you gather better data. You can estimate the state better if you're wiggling the control stick or something. You know, it turns out these are all just wrong. It makes no difference because you can subtract, subtract it off. There is one issue. If it turns out that your model is not quite what the thing is, then here the true T is not quite what you think it is. And when you do the subtraction, you might be left with some residuals or something. But that's a, that's a secondary issue. Doesn't it, the, in, in this case, it doesn't affect it at all. Okay, so again, there's a, there's a dual to all of this, and I think I'll, 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 I'll speed up because it's actually kind of boring, and there's some things I want to mention at the, uh, there's some stuff I want to cover at the end. Um, so, by the Cayley Hamilton theorem, you know, when you go C, C, A, C, A, when you get up to C, A to the N, you've just added a bunch more rows, which are linear combinations of rows above. So, I, it says basically if, if, you can, if you can figure out, if you can work out what the state is from measurements of U and Y at all, you can do it in N steps. As in the control case, doesn't mean it's a good idea to do it. You may want to take much more data and then average. I guess so far we have no noise, so that, that comment doesn't make any sense. But when you add noise, it will make sense. Okay. So I think we'll, we'll go over, uh, we'll... we'll um, I think what I'll do is just go forward to the what would be obvious here, uh, and I've lost that the least squares observers. Aha! Uh -huh. no, 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 I'm looking. Ah, thank you. There we go. I got it. Okay. So, so the most obvious thing to do in the case when there's actual measurement noise is to set it up exactly as a least squares problem, and you'd have this. You'd estimate your state to be the observer matrix, um, pseudo-inverse here, oh, which in this case, if it's, if it's actually an observable system, is O, is, is, I guess it's skinny, so it's O transpose, O trans, then quantity O transpose inverse times this thing, um, like that, uh, times this thing. And this thing, it's got all sorts of names, um, I don't know, let's see, this is something like it's, it's your guess of the output due to the initial state. That's what this signal in here is. Because this is your guess of the output that would be due to the input that you actually measured if there were no state, if there were no initial state. Okay? Then this is what you really did measure. The difference is the output that's due to the non-zero initial state. And so that's, that's how you get all of this. And um, I can mention something about this, and I think I'll even, uh, but I, I won't go on and, 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 and do the rest. I, I should say, this alone here, if you wrote this in recursive form, you would actually have a very rudimentary form of something called a Kalman filter, which you may or may not have heard of. Um, but this thing, which is just an, this is just an exercise from like week four of the class. Um, it's easy, it's easy, to, it's very simple to state this. You get things that will work, these work unbelievably well. I mean, unbelievably, I mean, this beats anything, any kind of, kind of intuitive scheme you could make up if you wanted to track a vehicle or something like that. Just something this, this simple, um, which would end up being a handful of, just a handful of lines, would actually make estimates of states and positions that would beat any, any intuitive method you could possibly imagine, so. But that's kind of the theme of the class. So, okay. So actually, I think I'm going to quit there because I claim all of this is just sort of um, variations on, on on applications. 
Well, we could look at one application, but I don't know. Um, it was going to be just, it's an application with our, our friend, the, um, our friend, the range measurements. Maybe I'll just do that very quickly and we'll look at that. So here's the example. It's just to give you a rough flavor of how these things work. By the way, there are entire classes you can take on uh, state estimation. So you can take one in finance or you can take one in Aero Astro where it's used to track vehicles or it's used for navigation. So you can take entire classes, probably three or four in wildly different fields and it's just on this material. So some of them are kind of cool, actually a lot of them. A lot of them are kind of cool. So, okay. So we'll just do a very simple baby example. It's a particle that's moving uh, in R2 with uniform velocity. I have linear noisy range measurements from various directions like that. You can see they're all kind of concentrated from here. Um, by the way, if I have uh, range sensors from here, that's not great. If, if someone gave you a bunch of range sensors and said arrange them to make your estimation job, uh, I don't know, easy, you'd spread them around. Um, and in fact, you might even do something like put, you know, you'd probably s spread them around e evenly ar around, you know, maybe even at four, four points, uh, cross points like this. Uh, because then you're sort of me you're measuring different things. Um, a bad thing to do would be to put all the range sensors in the same place, kind of like this, right? Because if you put all the range measurements in the same place, are, are these getting, getting, making different measurements? Oh, yes, they are. But they're not that different. So you're sort of, you can imagine now that your estimation might not be that good. Okay? So that's it. Um, and we'll make the range noises um, have an error on the order of one. Um, and we'll assume that the RMS value of the velocity is not, is, is not much more than two. So actually, we can write this out as a linear system. This, to, to, to describe a, a particle with uniform velocity is just basically this. It says that, um, it says xt plus one is, um, it is gonna be, the, the bottom block says that the bottom block of xt, which is the velocity, is equal to the identity times the velocity, it means it doesn't change. So the bottom two entries of x of t are constant and the top two change, uh, actually they're affine, okay? And then your measurement matrix is gonna look like that. So that's what you have. So the, the true initial position of velocities are these. This makes no difference. Um, but then here would be a, um, here would be an example of, of, a, of a track here. Um, what's shown here, are that line shows you the true, so the particle's moving at a constant speed. This is the, that, that would be the, me the range measurement if the range measurements were perfect. But you can see we put a lot of noise on the range measurements. So basically, any single range measurement would be, snapshot of range measurement would be completely useless. You'd make an outrageously bad estimate of the position and velocity. So, you know, obviously, um, from this. Um, what you can do now is actually just carry out this least squares uh, observer fitting, um, and we can actually work out the, um, the actual RMS position error, and you get something, something like this. And it's, it's hardly surprising what you see. Um, but the velocity error actually goes to zero, and the position error actually will, uh, it won't go to zero, but it will, it will go to a, a, a small steady state number. So, so that's, um, that's what it is. That, that's how these things work. So, and this is just a taste of it. Technically, you, you could write all the code to make this plot. You could have worked everything out and so on because it's just an application. So, okay, so that officially uh, finishes the material for the, for the class. Uh, the truth is that the last two topics we looked at were just sort of applications. So a little bit more than an application, but they're, they were not real material. The singular value decomposition was the last real material. So. What I want to do now, though, is actually have, I, just, I wanted to have a bunch of uh, comments about, about the whole, like, how does it all fit together and things like that. So that's what I wanted to look at next. So the first thing is I wanted to say a few things about linear algebra. Not that I haven't said, been talking about linear algebra for a quarter, but I thought I'd just say a few things about it. So just, you know, to organize my thoughts and so it doesn't come out totally randomly. Um, I want to zoom out a little bit here. So, uh, the first thing that should be kind of obvious, if you, if you haven't seen it, you will see it or something like that. But the point is it comes up in a lot of practical contexts. Um, it comes up in EE and mechanical engineering, civil engineering, aero astro, operations research, economics, machine learning, uh, vision, and it goes on and on. 
Um, what's interesting is that actually it, that wasn't always the case. So signal processing 25 years ago basically went on and on with how you process a scalar signal, for example. You would barely, you could go grab a, an issue of IEEE transaction signal processing, you won't find a matrix in it. Okay. Now, totally the opposite. E everything involves ideas like, it's extremely rare to find something that doesn't. Okay. The same is true in economics and in finance and things like that. Um, in Aero Astro and Control 25 years ago, the idea of sort of a multivariable system with multiple, that was this exotic thing that only PhD level students would, under, you know, would, 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 would study. It's, that's completely wrong. It's, it's all, all real systems are designed this way, no exceptions. So this, that's, that's just the way things work now. I mean, you don't design you know, a control system for a modern airplane or something like that, or a process, or anything. You don't even make an ABS system or anything like that. You don't do it without matrices. So, and this is a change. This was simply not true 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there were people who talked about matrices, and they were made fun of, in fact, by the people who were designing systems that worked. Anyway, so um, I wasn't one of those people. Anyway, um, okay. So uh, the point that's kind of it should also be kind of obvious is that um, nowadays, you know, linear algebra you can actually do it. Um, that's the, I mean, you can, if you're fiddling around, you can play with MATLAB. MATLAB is a toy and it's not, I mean, I have arguments with people about this, but in fact, no real implementation uses MATLAB, although there are people who say that's not true. Um, it is a toy, um, I, in my opinion, and, and real implementations are not done this way, and that, that's often true. Now, now, 20 years ago, a class like this, there'd be zero computational component. None. Z absolutely zero. By the way, you can imagine how boring it would be. I just, anyway, well, we, we won't go there. Um, it was kind of boring, actually, to tell you the truth. But so you're, anyway, luckily for you, um, you were born later in, in this. Okay. Um, now, of course, you have MATLAB. You've been playing around with that. By the way, there are other variations on MATLAB you can, you can use. There's, there's Octave and, and things like that. And, and the truth is that these days, if you know what you're doing with some object-oriented system, you can make it look like, MATLAB, except that it will actually be a real language. So Python could easily be made to look like MATLAB, for example. Um, so you could write things like y equals ax times a, a. You could write y equals ax plus v, and all the right things would happen. Um, uh, there's real codes. Um, LA Pack is, is something you should have just heard that name. I, I don't want you to leave this class without hearing that name. Even though we talk nothing about how to actually carry out these computations, it's important that you know that the things, by the way, that MATLAB does which does nothing but parse what you type in. The actual numerics is done by open source, public domain software written by, well, professors and graduate students. Um, and it's LA PAC. Um, then there's, there's others that when you get into large, large systems, there's other, there's other schemes like that as well. But this is a good thing to know about. Um, and just to give you a rough idea, I'm sure you kind of know this, but maybe no one made a big deal about it. Um, if you have, let's say, a thousand variables and you want to solve, uh, I don't know, let's say, Let's do a thousand variable. Let's do a least squares problem. Let's do a least squares problem that looks like this. Um, a thousand, and let's make this like two thousand. Okay, it can be anything you like. It could be I have two thousand measurements to estimate a thousand parameters. By the way, this is obviously not a small problem, right? That's two million real numbers to describe this matrix. Everybody see what I'm talking about here? This is serious business. You could make a big story about how sophisticated this is. You'd be taking in 2,000 measurements and doing the optimal, you know, you could make a big long song and dance about how you're doing, um, you know, I'm blending 2,000, um, you know, measurements to, to, to get 1,000 estimates of blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, how fast do you think? How long does it take to do that? You might have some rough idea. I don't know. Does anyone know? You type a backslash b in MATLAB for this. What? Second. You're right. About a second. Okay. So the answer is about a second. Might be two seconds. I don't know. Something like that. I don't. You know. What? Thousand. Two thousand by thousand. Do it twice though, so it gets loaded into. Okay. Sorry. <clears throat> um, uh, well, well, no. but you know, it's on the order of a second, two, three, something like that. Okay. Um, by the way, this is just. These are just. This is just stunning. The fact that you can do this. 
Um, this is something unheard of. This is sort of what happens when you ignore Moore's law for, let's say, 20 years or something, and then come back and check again how fast it is. This is this is the kind of thing that that happens. Um, okay. Now, in fact, uh, and this is a beautiful topic. It's something actually some of you might want to look at. Uh, by the way, I don't. I think things like this just have not really propagated too far. Um, so there's a lot of times when you might want to solve. Do least squares with 2,000 measurements to estimate 1,000 things. That's a big thing. That's, a, that's like a big system. The fact that you can do this in seconds with total reliability, I think actually has not diffused into uh, general knowledge. So, in fact, I had a professor in my office and I asked him to estimate how long this would take and he said half an hour. I won't reveal his name. But uh, how many? Four. On your laptop. No, on Kona. On Kona, oh, okay, four seconds, there we go, so it's four. That's because it's QR. Yeah, okay, fine, four seconds, is a rough idea. Okay, um, actually, another, an interesting thing we haven't talked about at all is it turns out if you want to do things like least squares, solve linear equations, when uh, you can do this for much, much, much bigger, way bigger matrices, provided they have special structure. Okay? Now, special structure, the typical one would be sparsity. Sparsity means a lot of the entries are zero, in which case there's methods that are just amazing and extend to things like 10,000, 40,000, a million, depending on, on your luck. There's other structures, like for example, if it's banded or tridiagonal and all this kind of stuff, and there's this, this the whole world of knowing the structures and how it, they, they imply fast methods. And this would take you to things like how people solve PDEs and all sorts of other stuff, but it's quite, that, that's worth knowing. Um, Actually, I encourage you in the future to, um, to, you know, to, to learn about these things, actually. So don't, don't, please don't live your life as just in, in MATLAB. I, I, uh, I, there's something, even if you do, please you know, look, know what's under the hood and actually know then what, you, if, what would happen, even if you have no intention of ever doing it, of actually finding, uh, figuring out what a real implementation would do as well. So that's a, that's a good thing. I, I won't say much uh, more about that. Um, this whole classes you could take on this at Stanford, entire ones. So uh, literally two on numerical linear algebra. Okay? So that I know of. Well, actually, no, sorry, I, know, I know of a couple others. So there's maybe two or three. You can even take one in geophysics and all sorts of, okay. So, okay, now I want to say something about, uh, about linear algebra and sort of my view of how it all fits together. So. I think th there's really like several uh, levels of understanding. I, you could add a fourth one, but let's. Let, the most basic is this. Um, the most basic level of understanding is kind of at the high school level, and it goes like this. You know, what you should know is this. If you have 17 variables and 17 equations, there's usually a solution. And that's when you were tortured uh, by solving whatever, three equations and three unknowns for no particular reason at whenever you, that you were tortured doing this, okay? So that's, that's and then maybe sometimes 17 equations and 17 variables, there wasn't a solution or there was more than one and somebody waves their hands or something like that. Um, and the same high school view would say something like this. It's actually, it's just degree of freedom accounting is what it is. So for example, you have 80 variables and 60 equations, you just do some accounting and you say, well, I've got 20 extra degrees of freedom. You could use those degrees of freedom for anything you like, but there's basically a 20, this is roughly a 20 dimensional subspace of freedom. You could use it to minimize the two norm, sorry, the, the, the uh, Euclidean norm, which is what we've been doing, and you get a least norm solution. You could use it to minimize something else. You could use it to do anything. I mean, other stuff. There's just degrees of freedom you could absorb. Of course, if that's an estimation problem, this is probably not good news, because it basically means that the only thing you can do is, anal is you don't have enough measurements to estimate what you want, okay? Now, so it's very important to always start, I think, when you look at a problem from this point of view, just do the basic accounting. What are we talking here? Do I have more measurements and unknowns, less? How many degrees of freedom do I have left and less and all that? Now, of course, what you know, at the next level, you learn things about singularity, rank, range, null space, and so on. Um, and what that would be, for example, would be here. You, if uh, someone asks you, you say, look, I have 17 equations, 17, but there's no solution. Why is that? And you go, ah, well, you see that 17 by 17 matrix was singular. And they go, well, what does that mean? And you say, well, what it means is this. There's two ways to view it. The first is, you thought you had 17 different equations. Actually, you don't. You have 16. 
because equation number 13 is derivable from the others. Everybody know what I'm talking about here? So in fact, I'm talking about the left, uh, I'm talking about the rows being uh, dependent. They could say something like this. They'd say, you thought you had 17 variables, 17 knobs to wiggle or whatever you want to call them. That's what you thought you had. Actually, you had 16. You know why? Because the action of this fourth variable can be exactly replicated by an action of these other variables. Okay? So you thought you had 17 knobs, 17 design variables, 17 inputs, whatever you want to call it, to mess with, but you didn't. And that was hidden in this matrix, which was 17 by 17, so it wasn't obvious to see by the eye. Okay? So that's, that's the next step. Now the platonic view, this is really, this is really, uh, this, is re this is basically called uh, math. It's very important, okay? Because it, and it basically says something like this. It says that this matrix has rank five. Um, it says this is full rank, so it really certifies the fact that there really are 20 extra degrees of freedom here. That's very important to understand, okay? Now the, the, I'll tell you the good thing about it. Now the good thing about this is everything is precise and unambiguous. There's no such thing as, you know, there's no waffling, no nothing, and, you know, you don't, there's no nonsense. It's either singular or it's not, period. It's, it's rank is 17 or it's 15, but it's not like anything in between and it doesn't depend on who's looking at it or anything like that. It's, it's, things are true or false. False. Now, what's nice about this is this at least, this, it's nice because it's very, clear and unambiguous. Um, unfortunately, it can be misleading in practice. And, and we've already seen, um, you know, at least one example of that. For example, if I have a 17 by 17 matrix and it's singular, if I perturb, if I pick literally any random entry and perturb it by an arbitrarily small amount, the matrix becomes non-singular. And I say, done. It's all done. Now you can, you can invert it. And then you better leave quickly before they actually uh, but theoretically, they can now invert it, and there's, there's no problem. So in this case, that would, it would be misleading to say, for example, to make a, a statement, which you could on the basis of just a platonic mathematical view, you could make the statement that non-singularity is not a problem in practice. Someone would say, why would you say that? And you'd say, no problem. Any matrix that's singular, if I perturb it, if, if I perturb its entries by random numbers so small that they couldn't possibly affect that practical application, I guarantee you with probability one that the resulting matrix is non-singular, done, end of story. Okay, so, and at this level, that's, you can't argue with it, it's correct. Um, that's interesting, that's a, a mathematical argument for why you don't need to know the math. Did you notice that? That's what it was. So, okay. Now, at the next level, this is level three. These are sort of levels of understanding. The next level, we have the quantitative level. Now, the quantitative level, it's based not on qualitative things like rank three. And it's based on ideas like least squares and SVD. So there you'd say things like, you'd say things like, uh, someone say, what's the rank of that? And you'd go, uh, it's around six. And they'd say, what are you talking about? How can the rank be about six? And you go, well, it depends on, you know, how big your, uh, what's your noise level and what do you consider small and big? and everything. So it's a bit wishy-washy, um, but it's actually much more, it's more useful in practice. Um, so as long as you don't think when you're talking about this, you're actually doing math, which you're not at that point. So you have to keep them very separate. So this is very, very useful. And in this case, no one would be fooled by somebody coming along and offering to sprinkle some perturbation dust on your matrix to make it non-singular. Okay, no one would be fooled by it because they'd say, yeah, go ahead, sprinkle all the dust you like. If you sprinkle all the dust on it, all that happens is one of the singular values, the zero, now becomes 10 to the minus 10. And you say, are you done? And the person says, yeah, it's non-singular. I'm leaving now. And you say, well, it may be non-singular, but the, the minimum singular value is 10 to the minus 10. I can't do anything with it that I would want it to have to do with a non-singular matrix because, for example, the inverse is gigantic. Condition number is still 10 to the 10 and blah, 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 or more. Okay. Now, the interpretation in, in, in this analysis, it really depends on the practical context. And these, these ideas are extremely useful in practice. Um, so I think these ideas by themselves, I think, are, if you, if you, if you sort of have arrested development here, it, it's maybe not, not so good. Arrested mathematical development, I'm talking about. Actually, curiously, 
the rest of development here is probably okay, in, in my opinion. It, it doesn't lead you to, because you, you know you don't know a lot of things. Um, and it's no problem, You just because you're, you're not expecting it to work. And you type A backslash B and it says singular working precision, you go, oh well, I'll try something else. It's, not a, it's just not a big deal. Here, you can actually be a little bit dangerous because you can walk around and talk about things like controllability and things like a singularity and rank and so on. Um, this is actually quite, uh, th this stuff is actually very, very useful in, in, in practice. And I want to talk about one more level um, above this. And that would be the algorithmic and, comp and computational sophistication. So that would be um, another level beyond this, would be to actually know how fast and how well you could actually carry out those calculations in practice. Um, and that would be, for example, what it would take, for example, if you were going to, let's say, start Google. Let's just say, because that's just, that's nothing but a singular value decomposition. But it's one based on, uh, on a, I can, in a billion by billion matrix. Okay? And I can tell you right now, uh, you can't type a billion by billion matrix in to MATLAB and ask it to, to and type SVD of it. Okay, so that's that next level where you, you know how fast you can do things. Can you do them in real time? You could know things like, ooh, that's a big matrix, but you know what? It's very sparse. I bet we can do this. Uh, we, we didn't talk about any of these things, but you can do things like calculate the... I, let me just give one example of that, and then I'll, I'll move on to the next topic. Here's the last example. You remember early on, there was this idea of representing a huge matrix as an outer product. If you did this... For example, you had a method to speed up simulation of it by some huge amount if you succeeded. Okay? And later, you know, early on you learned that the smallest factorization you could do depends on the rank. It is the rank. And you learned a method for doing it, QR. Fine. Later in the class, when we studied SVD, you learned a method for getting an approximation that's low rank. Then you could take a matrix that's absolutely full rank giant, and you could say, here's my, here's this three rank approximation is good enough. And you, you win big because you can now multiply like so fast, it's amazing. You can do compression, you can do all sorts of crazy stuff now, okay? Now that works if A is up to, let's say, 1,000 by 2,000 or something like that. Maybe 2,000 by 2,000, maybe a bit more. Um, but the interesting, the really interesting one is when A is a million by a million. You can't store a million by million matrix, let alone compute its SVD using the LA pack routines. Obviously. And yet, that's exactly the case where a low rank approximation would be like super, super cool. Because then you can say, hey, you know your million by million matrix. People would laugh at you. They'd say, it's not a million by, I mean, you can't even store a million by million matrix, so don't tell me about it. And you go, yeah, no, what I'm telling you is I have a rank three approximation of it. Okay. So, there, you can't just form the matrix and call SVD. It's ridiculous. There are methods that do the following. They will actually calculate the rank three. They, they will calculate the SVD uh, sequentially. So they'll, and, and they're extremely efficient and fast. The only thing they need of A is you have to be able to multiply by A, and you have to multiply by A transpose. You have to provide routines for doing that. Okay? So if A, for example, is the forward mapping in, for example, MRI or PET or any... Anything like that, where you have a fast method, for example, based on Fourier transforms, you can use, you can actually do low rank approximation. So, I can tell no one has any idea what I'm talking about. That's fine. All I'm saying is there's, a, there's, another, uh, there's another level of sophistication where all of the ideas here can, can, you can use on, on very, very large systems. Okay. So, let me go on and just answer one more question. Uh, or address one more issue is, is like what's what's next um, so there's lots and lots of classes um, now of course after you take the final you may have a different view um, uh, of all these things so um, oh I forgot to tell you since uh, since we give our, our final uh, or rather I don't, whatever that I don't think there's no way we can construct our final to be within the it's a blatant violation of the registrar's rules by, by the way um, so at first, I thought we could call it just homework 10, but it counts for a lot. Um, but it turns out you're not allowed to assign homework on the last. Anyway, so. Um, but there's an, yeah, I should mention, when you are doing the final, if you want to take a break, 
Uh, you can go fill out the teaching evaluations, uh, <laughs> which is fine with me. I don't care. That's why we have tenure. Uh, so you can do anything you like, but if you get really pissed off, you, you can always do that just to unwind for a little bit. So, and that's actually, a, I think, a, that's, because, that's possible because of our uh, flagrant and open violation, and now on video uh, viola uh, state violation of, um, of the registration. Okay, sorry, we'll go back to that. Um, uh, yes. So uh, there's a, a sequel to this class, uh, but it's, uh, it won't be taught until next year. Um, now, I, I am teaching uh, this class and, and this class, 364A and, and B, um, winter and, and spring. So I should say a little bit, I mean, there's zillions of other classes you, you could take and all the topics I've been talking about. Um, but I'll say, let me say a little bit about what this class is, is, is about. Um, and I, there's a simple way to do it. This class, a lot of the techniques here relied on sort of least squares. Uh, least squares, least norm, you know, and some variations on that. And so there, there were like analytical formulas like A transpose. And so I can tell you what this class is. This class is basically says, uh, what if you, it, it extends least squares to other things, like the maximum uh, value or the sum of the absolute values. Also, in, a, in, the cla in, the, in 263, we don't really have any way to, do th to handle things like to say that a, a vector is positive. You see what I'm talking about? Like if we do y equals ax plus v, and x is a, you know, is a power or, a, or something like that here. Um, if, if we do least squares, you know, and then x would be a, a vector of powers, uh, y would be some observed temperatures or something like that. That's measurement error. Um, we have no way of telling least squares that x is positive. We would just calculate a least square solution, and if we're really lucky, the estimated x will come out to be positive. Okay? If not, it'll be negative, and we'll have a bit of a problem. Um, so it turns out, by the way, people have dealt with this for years using all sorts of ad hoc methods. In fact, using all the ideas you know about, like regularization and things like that. So, and they're completely ad hoc. It turns out you can handle those flawlessly. You lose your analytical formulas, but you can calculate things just as fast as you could before with least squares. Um, it's even more so when you do things like when you design inputs, which we've been doing. We just did least squares inputs. Least squares, the least squares input that takes a system from here to a zero state or from one state to another. You could do things like add conditions like this, which is actually kind of cool. Um, and these are quite real now. You could add a condition like that. That's a real condition. Um, you will not find, if you go up to an MRI machine, a note that says, under no circumstances shall the sum of the squares of the, of the RF pulse put in be, less, be more than this. It will not say that. Okay, or when you buy an, a motor for a, a disk drive or something like that. There'll be current limits, there'll be things like that, and they're gonna look like this. Turns out you can solve those problems exactly. And that's what 364 is. Um, when you go to 364, there actually is a lot more fun problems you can solve. You can actually really do all sorts of things like in finance and machine learning and stuff like that. So that's what this class is about. I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Actually, it's a bit embarrassing. I believe next week I'm going to have to give the first lecture for it because um, I'll be in India the first uh, when the actual class starts. So <clears throat> I've never done that. I've never taped ahead the first lecture before. I'm deeply embarrassed, but, but it was going to happen sometime. So anyway, it's gonna, it, it will happen. So. All right, so with that, I'll say the class is over. I, um, I have to thank um, Jacob, Young, and Thanos uh, for an enormous amount of, uh, of help putting it all together and all that kind of stuff. And um, unless there's questions, um, we'll just quit, quit here. I mean, I'd be happy to answer questions about these or other classes and stuff like that. But otherwise, thanks for uh, slogging through it. Oh, and enjoy the final. <laughs> I forgot to say, I'll be in Austin while you're taking uh, most of it, but then I'll be back Saturday early morning. And I'll be... Um, I'll be in touch. I'll, I'll be around Saturday. So. Good. Right here.